A corporal. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Where were you living at the time? Uh, I was living uh, on 91 Renson Street. Brooklyn. And why did you join? From my country. Why did you pick the army? Um, well, the mar Marines were too gung-ho and I don't like the water. You know, I, I don't mind sailing in a boat, but I don't like long-term water. And the Air Force didn't move me, so I picked the Army. Do you recall your first days in service? My first one? Your first days in the service? Um, well, I was, um, when I raised my hand, I was given um, the assignment as acting corporal to a group of, at that time, civilians. And I was told that uh, I was to report to Fort Dix, and I was an acting corporal ever since. And what did it feel like those first few days? Um, just a responsibility. Uh, that's all. Can you tell me about your boot camp? That boot camp experiences? Um, well, I took basic training at Fort Dix and um, I don't recall the outfit I was with and I don't recall the sergeant's name but um, I do recall um, the tear gas, tear gas um, indoctrination, and uh, I recall the uh, rifle range because I made sharpshooter, and um, the end of my basic training. I uh, was third highest in the class. There was three others that uh, uh, I remember their names, Muse and Larocco, were ahead of me. And I got a three-day pass. Now, the, uh, you said about the the tear gas indoctrination. What is that? What does that entail? Um, it's um, taking your mask, put it on, and uh, testing to see that uh, it's it's holding, and then they have you take it off and recite your name, rank, and serial number. And meanwhile, you're coughing and you're tearing, and then they let you out, uh, go outside, where a lot of fellows were throwing up. Mm. Now, you said you didn't remember the sergeant. Do you remember any of your instructors? It's been a long time and a long siege. Mm. How did you get through basic training? Uh, I was um, third highest in my class. 
So you found it pretty. And easy I, I found it pretty, pretty easy to tell you the truth. So um, uh, from there, I went to um, uh, Fort Bliss, Texas. because I was engrossed in anti-aircraft artillery and I was trained on 90 millimeters and doing 20 long toms. Then from there I went to um, uh, Fort Lewis where they shipped me over to Korea. It was on the ship Eltinge, General Eltinge. What was that journey like? Uh, monotonous. Uh, the only thing I saw was uh, some uh, porpoises and uh, an occasional um, well, other than that, it was very monotonous. And when you arrived in Korea, what were your first impressions? Well, the first place I, wrote, I arrived at was um, Japan. Oh. And that was in uh, Katikai Beach, Japan and we tested our guns and uh, from there we went on a um, another ship an LSD or uh, no it was a landing ship and uh, we went over into Korea uh, on the Incheon invasion. Tell me about that. Well, we landed and we unloaded our vehicles and uh, The Marines had already been there. <laughs> so it was reasonably quiet. There was small, sparse gunfire. Uh, I think it was snipers. And uh, we decosmolined our vehicles and uh, we became uh, uh, shotgunning convoys. Uh, two of our vehicles, uh, half track with quad 50s, was in the forward part, and in the back was um, twin 40s, uh, M45 chassis and uh, our half tracks were M16s with an M45 firing mount and we were shotgunning uh, convoys because they were being ambushed back and forth from the front lines we, we would uh, go back and shotgun another convoy up. So it was hot. Mosquitoes could carry away. And uh, we had very little skirmishes. because of the 
firepower we had. So uh, we shotgunned our convoys back and forth, and then they put us back on rest. That's when we were traveling from town to town. That's why so many places I've seen. Uh, they put me on the end of Pusan Airstrip. And I was um, on the front of the airstrip and um, a jet plane got shot down by a MiG and um, it appears that the pilot died or was dying when he smashed into my vehicle. Uh, it was, um, he didn't drop his armament load, so he smashed in with uh, napalm and 500 pounders on, on his uh, ship, and uh, rockets were going in all different directions. And that's where I saw a little white light uh, it was sunlight coming through the tent and I ran towards it which I was on fire I was 75 percent burned 62nd and third degree and I ran out and one of the 500 pounders went off and it blew me into the garbage ditch so I climbed out of it, and I was still on flames. And every time I stopped, the flames would come up. So I just kept running. And I ran, ran the full length of the airstrip. And by then the fire burned out, and I was walking back, and uh, an airman came out of his uh, Quonset hut, and he says, oh my God. And I thought, what's the matter with him? And I looked down and the flesh was hanging off my arms. So, I was brought back in an ambulance. Uh, we used to call meat wagon. And from there, uh, We went to um, Poussin Field Hospital and then I was helicoptered over to another hospital and then I was flown to um, no we, we, we stopped at Midway and um, the plane bumped into um, into the wing, so they had to. We had to stay over in a uh, small field hospital and Midway, and then we were then flown to uh, Tokyo Army Hospital. Uh, and then we were flown to uh, Brook Army Hospital, which I was there for quite a few years. Long recovery. Uh, it, it's been a long siege. It's. Uh, I was, I was in bed with my arms hanging in IV frames uh, for months, and I was blind, 
my eyesight, I saw, started to see silhouettes and it started coming back. My hair was burned off. So, it's been on and off. Well, I discharged in 1952 and I was still in the hospital uh, taking plastic surgery. And it's been a it's been a long haul. And what hospital were you in when you were discharged? Um, Kingsbridge VA Hospital. How did they transport you all the way from Tokyo? Um, from um, Brook Army Hospital. They brought me with an ambulance to the train and I, I had a drawing room with a, a, an assistant sergeant and uh, it took me about two, three days to get to um, uh, uh, Kingsbridge VA in the Bronx. Now, Colonel Soderberg advised me to um, to go to um, Kingsbridge VA because they had very good plastic surgeons there. So I went there, and uh, it was in my own town. So I was there for years. So it's been a long siege. Mm. Before um, your injuries, could you describe for me what a typical day was like in the service? Well, we waited for our food, which came in a jeep, and uh, half of the time, if it was hot, we were fighting the mosquitoes, and if it was cold, uh, now I was up at the Chosen Reservoir, they call it the Frozen Chosen. It was bitter cold. and. Uh, by the time the jeep got there, it was even lukewarm, and uh, we ate a cold. Cold meat, cold mashed potatoes, and we, we, we really would prefer sea rations uh, that we could heat up other than the, the meal, because the meal was too cold. Even our coffee uh, turned cold in no time short. So it was a hellacious kind of a time yeah. because uh, well, the Chinese were coming over and they were coming over like ants and we opened our weapons up on them. And uh, it seemed like you kill one or two of them and a couple of them would pick up the same weapon and continue. So it, it, it was like ants. That's what it reminded me of, little ants. What was your, your daily routine? Um, all we did was worry about mortars, and uh, it was very rare that they came in. 
But when they did, we would hunker down and just wait for them to end. And uh, we just kind of hung out. Were there, were there other um, combat incidences uh, aside from what, what we were discussing before the, the invasion? Um, lucky enough, we came in after the Marines got there. So we, we degreased our weapons and we, we automatically went to shotgunning convoys um, to and from the front lines. And uh, we could hear the guns going off, but uh, we, we weren't involved uh, in too many firefights. Uh, occasion a sniper would, you'd see a tracer, uh, mm -hmm. but that's all. So, did you see combat? Uh, yes, but um, at a distance. Mm. So you weren't like personally? No, the only time I ever saw combat was uh, when mortars came in. Yeah. You'd dive into a hole and you'd hope for the best. Were there any casualties in your unit? Except for the final uh, accident, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I lost my whole crew. I was the only one alive. I lost four men good buddies. Tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences. When I found out the war was over, I was, um, well, the, I found out the ceasefire. The war was never over. Mm. The ceasefire ended, I was in uh, Kingbridge VA hospital when the report came in and a, um, a reporter from the News and Mirror asked me what I thought of it. And I told him I passed the 38th parallel four times. And finally, the war was over. So we went back and forth across that 30th parallel quite a few times. Mm -hmm. I remember when MacArthur said we'd be home by Christmas. He didn't say what year. <laughs> told me that you were awarded the Purple Heart. Yes. It's the bloodiest medal mm. that you can get. Uh, someone gets killed in combat, their wife or their mother receives a Purple Heart. You can cut your finger in combat get a purple heart. So it's from one extreme to the other. Right. Okay. Now for those quality of life questions. How did you stay in touch with family? I had two sisters 
and I used to write to them whenever I could when we weren't moving. My mother died, my father died. So I had just two sisters. So um, that's the only family I had. And you already kind of talked about the food. Um, is there any more to say about the quality of food in the military? When you're hungry, it all tastes good. <laughs> Did you find that you had enough supplies? Well, we were bringing supplies up to the line. So what we would do every now and then is borrow some sea rations. And there's another... Uh, case item, it was called D-rations, which were um, uh, for sections, you know, tanks or that type of. Pressure or stress? Um, certain points. Uh, there was more of a stress when I was hit. Because mm. I lost four men. No, I was um, I was in shock, and uh, they they hit me with morphine, and um, I was hallucinating. I I thought I was a prisoner of war for a period of time. You didn't know who was holding you. No. Side. Uh, they 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 used a striker frame, which flips you over, they bolt two pillars down, and they flip you over. Mm. And uh, when they take it off, they take off an oil cloth, so to speak. And it was very, very painful. And that's when I thought I was being tortured. So I was hallucinating, thinking I was in a Korean torture camp. It took a while to convince me that um, they, I was in an army hospital. What did, what did they finally say or do that made you believe? They just kept repeating it. Frank, you're in a military hospital. And, uh, every now and then I'd come back out of it. And then I'd look around and I'd say, well, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm in a hospital. Must have been scary. Yeah. And then I'd go back in hallucinations again. Because yeah. they fed me morphine. Uh, they took IVs, the veins they took out, and they plugged them in with a, 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 an IV mm -hmm. bottle. And it just kept dripping because the biggest problem with burns is uh, dehydration. That's why it was SOP, Standard Order Procedure, for everyone to go to um, Brook Army Hospital because uh, they figured an atomic war, there'd be a lot of burns. And they were trying to figure out ways of taking care of the, the burn patients. So I was kind of a big guinea pig for a while. So. Was 
there anything special that you did for good luck? No. I figured I made my own luck and my own hard luck. How did people entertain themselves? Uh, we played cards. We gambled a lot. I remember I had a big pile of money in front of me, tens and twenties, and I thought I could never lose. I lost the whole pile. So, that's when I was in the, uh, as a private in uh, Fort Bliss, Texas. Mm. What about uh, overseas? Was there anything, was there even any downtime in which to entertain oneself? Uh, no, we, we missed a lot of the shows, like uh, Jack Benny was there, but we missed him. And uh, the only place I saw entertainment when I came back from, uh, when I was in uh, Tokyo Army Hospital, I saw Earl Flynn and uh, Marilyn Monroe and Ava Gardner. Uh, they were entertaining us and Jack Benny. And Go ahead. Th that's about the only things I ever saw. Was that USO? The yeah, it was during Operation Starlift. So every now and then the Red Cross would come by and give us some donuts. And uh, occasionally we'd have a movie, an outdoor movie. That's it. Hmm. Did you go on leave at any point? No, I, I, uh, I was supposed to go on R&R &R when I got hit. Oh, and that was a long-term R&R. Yeah. I didn't get passes until uh, I was uh, months into, uh, into recuperating. Mm. They gave me passes to go into town. And uh, I'd get on a bus and people would move out of the way. They thought I was some kind of freak. So it was rather uncomfortable uh, until I learned to live with it. Yeah. Don't forget my scars were a lot worse. This scar ran down to here under my neck. I have webs on my my mouth. And I have one ear missing, and so it's a lot to cope with. And all of a sudden, yeah, all of a sudden you're looked at as something strange. <laughs> But you learn to cope with it. Yeah. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events? Pardon? Any particularly humorous or unusual events? I can't think of any. Sometimes war is humorous in some ways. It's 
it's a sadistic way of looking at it. But um, there is some humor in war. But um, I can't really remember a, a instant that um, comes to mind. Were there any pranks that the servicemen would pull on each other? Well, um, it never happened to me, but uh, we had one fella that never washed, and they gave him a GI party. What it is is they haul him into a shower and scrub him down with brown soap. And um, another thing, uh, some fellas go out on pass and they'd come back in and they'd be short sheeted. What they do is fold the sheet over and couldn't get down into the sheet. Or they put cornflakes in their bed, you know. 